morning. I believe it's still morning. And thank you very much for coming, for those few who are here. So today we'll be talking about women's suffrage in Canada. Um, so as we have decided, I'm going to break it up into two parts. So this is going to be part one of my presentation. Uh, this is a very dense topic, as I found, and it was very uh, difficult to decide how to make it into a 10-minute coherent presentation that would tell a story and at the same time will be detailed enough because uh, th there is a timeline when women gain the right to vote in Canada in different provinces and in federal elections, but then there are a lot of events that took place around this timeline that directly or indirectly affected the situation. And um, so it was really, and, and also there are a lot of uh, sources online that are, um, contain varying amounts of details, but they're sometimes inconsistent and not very coherent. So it was, uh, it was challenging to compress it into a single coherent story. So I think uh, what, what I decided to do for the purposes of this presentation, and given the time constraints, I decided to give you a very brief outline and the timeline so that you have an idea just roughly when, um, uh, when, when we talk about uh, women's uh, right to vote in Canada, that you know approximately the timeline um, and then a little bit of uh, events around it. And then the second part of my presentation will be uh, about the person's case, or the famous five, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but I just thought it will be a very useful, um, very useful piece of information because this is a very uh, well-known story in Canada and it often comes up and I find that uh, many people, myself included, have a very vague idea what the story was and who were who was involved and how it is related to voting and etc so i thought it was a useful piece of reference if it comes up in, in a conversation or in, in any other context in canada okay so and i think i've uh, successfully used up a good chunk of my first part but anyway so let us begin okay so for l let us start with terminology the word suffrage is the legal right to vote. That's all it means. Women's suffrage is women's legal right to vote in political elections. And uh, those campaigns also uh, often involve the right to run for public office. So this is an important thing to remember that you have a right to vote and you have a right to run for public office or to be voted for. So this is not automatically, if you have a right to vote, it does not automatically mean that you can be elected yourself. Uh, suffrage or the right to vote is also referred to as franchise. So enfranchise someone means to give someone the legal right to vote or disfranchise someone to take away someone's legal right to vote. So this is just a different terminology that you may come across when people talk about voting rights. Now, another important distinction, an interesting distinction that I came across that I was not very clear on myself is the difference between a suffragist and suffragette. So suffragist can be a male or female member of the women's suffrage movement. So it's a man or a woman who is advocating for the women's right to vote. And this is usually, uh, this usually refers to peaceful activists who are seeking reform through legal, peaceful means. Now, the other term, suffragette, typically refers to a female activist who is seeking reforms through militant protests or illegal terms. And it often refers to British activists. This term is also used often by the opponents of this movement as a derogatory term. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the term suffragette itself is female. The noun is, is it's a um, feminine noun. Okay, so this is briefly the terminology around uh, this topic. Now, a little bit of history. Full citizenship was legally limited to men. Women were not allowed to vote. And more than that, by 1851, laws across 
the country, which was not even Canada at the time, uh, explicitly excluded female voters. So different laws uh, in different in different places, or not specifically provinces at the time. So 1836, Prince Edward Island, 1843, New Brunswick, 1849, the province of Canada, meaning Ontario and Quebec, and 1851, Nova Scotia. So this was before the Confederation. Uh, those areas or those regions had explicit laws that uh, prevented women from participating in political elections, from voting in those elections. So around 1851, women began to push for the legal right to vote and for the social reform more generally, for improvement in education as well as for access to higher education for women, for better health care, for access to employment and better conditions for employed women, and to end violence against women. So if you, incidentally, if you look at all those items, um, almost 100 years later, not, not quite, but 80 years later, we are 70 years later, we're looking at the same items, at the same issues in our society. Um, okay, so who, who are those women who struggled for their right to vote? Typically, these were white middle class women. They believed that suffrage would increase the influence of their class and this right will lead to a better country. The majority of Canadian suffragists advocating for, uh, were advocating for peaceful campaigning. Uh, they were supported by different social groups, by black abolitionists, for example, by Mary Ann Shad. She was an American anti-slavery activist, a publisher, a lawyer, and a teacher. Uh, they were supported by unionists and socialists, so socialists, those who uh, fight uh, for uh, to, to eliminate social, political, economical inequality in society. And they were also supported by temperance movement. In fact, um, many or at least some of the Canadian suffragists were also members of the temperance movement. The temperance movement is a political campaign in the 19th, early 20th century for moderation or total abstinence from alcohol. Because those women believe that alcohol is the root of all evil in the world. And as soon as we eliminate alcohol, we will solve all the world's problems. We're going to be good. So we know what came out of it. But at the time, they didn't know that. So they truly believed that it was a good thing. Okay. So, in 1876, so now I'm just giving you the timeline. In 1876, the Toronto Women's Literary Guild was founded. It was founded by Dr. Emily Stowe. She was the first, uh, ch the first Canadian physician, and for many years she remained the only female physician in Canada. She fought for access to higher education and for the right to vote for women. So in 1883, this organization, this Toronto, uh, the Toronto Women's Literary Guild becomes the Canadian Women's Suffrage Association. And initially, the focus was on local voting rights. So by 1990, widows and spinsters, or unmarried women, who own property receive some voting rights. So they can vote and run for office in some municipal council and school board elections. So, the idea is that if you don't have a man in the house, if you're a widow, if you're never married, you're allowed to vote. If you do have a man in the house, that's the man's job, to go and vote. Okay. So, obtaining the legal right to vote was not a point in time. Um, when I said in my, uh, in my post on Facebook that this year we're celebrating the centennial uh, it was actually just one date, It was, uh, and I'll talk about it later, it's actually when women were granted the right to vote federally, but it was a, it was a collection of dates, so it took several decades, so there is, no, uh, there is no single date when women became eligible to vote. So I'll just give you a timeline that's so that you have an idea of the process, how long it took and, and the, the different steps that, uh, 
uh, were involved. So the very first province in Canada to grant women the right to vote was Manitoba. It happened in January 1916, followed by Alberta in April and Saskatchewan in May. So you can tell that the West at the time was much more progressive and liberal than uh, what we than what it is now, or what it seems to be now, or at least the, the, that's the stereotype. We associate Western provinces with uh, more a conservative way of, uh, more, more of a conservative outlook. In 1917, British Columbia and Ontario followed suit. In April, the legislation was adopted. 1918, Nova Scotia. 1919, New Brunswick and Yukon. 1922, Prince Edward Island. Now, uh, you probably noticed that one province is missing, and that's Quebec. So when do you think Quebec gained its uh, female citizens' right to vote? In 1940. So in 1940 only, so before 1940, if you're a woman living in Quebec, you do not have a legal right to vote. So that was a bit of a shock to me. I didn't know that. Now, Women received the right to vote in federal elections in 1918. So this is across Canada. So as far as Quebec is concerned, and as far as um, um, New Brunswick, Yukon, Prince Edward Island, so female living in those provinces, uh, women living in those provinces were eligible to vote in the federal elections, but not at home in their province. Um, However, the federal right to vote excluded Asian and indigenous citizens, of course. I mean, it's for everybody, but it's not for everybody. That's the, that's the usual story. So this is only part of the process. Where we're talking about granting women the right to vote, we're talking about white and, interestingly, black women. But we exclude Asian women and indigenous people. Well, Asian citizens in general. Okay, so... 1947, in 1947, Chinese citizens are granted the right to vote, but not Japanese. And of course, that has to do with the Second World War. Uh, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights gets adopted by the UN. And Article 21 says, elections shall be by universal and equal suffrage. That means that all the citizens must have the right to vote. And of course, because Canada was one of the countries that voted for the declarations, for the Declaration, Canadians had no choice. They had to pass a law that complied with this declaration. So in 1948, the Federal Act removes race grounds for exclusion, but again, not for the indigenous people. Uh, in 1960, finally, everybody gets a right to vote. Now, 1960, again, it's one date. It wasn't, it's just when everybody, but different groups, I have a minute and a half, right? Um, different, different groups um, at different times became eligible, but 1960, that's finally, just if you think about it, what is it, like 60 years ago? Not even? So, and then this is a very interesting point. In 1982, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms becomes law. 1982, it guarantees the rights of Canadian citizens, including the right to vote. And to me, this was a very interesting, because it was the first time when I actually thought about it. I don't know about you, but for me and for many other people I talk to, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a kind of a, it's the document that provides the foundation for the Canadian nation. We think of it as something very basic, something that is a hallmark of Canada. But if you think about it, the document was actually adopted yesterday. So. It, it's, it's kind of, it, it, we have this disconnect, even if we know that it was 82, we never think about it in these terms. It's so ingrained in our perception of what Canada stands for. Okay, so can I just have 30 seconds to... 15 seconds 15, Oh my god, okay. I'll speed up. So, the movement went with strong resistance, you can imagine. So, and this is the last slide, I promise. And I just give you two examples of that, which are very, which are 30 years apart. 